He was as tough as they came. Terrific combination by Rockman. When he was 14 years old, he took down three grown men. Oh! Rock is a man who fears no man. It's the other guy who has to fear him. Rockman dominating the fight. Everybody told me I wasn't going to make it. I see the Rock. Hussein Rockman knew this was his one chance in life. He had something to fight for. It was do or die for me. What a story as Hussein Rockman becomes the heavyweight champion of the world. You ain't nobody. I say what I want to say to you. Hussein Rockman, the one punch wonder. He was kicking like a woman. <laughs> this is it for you, Lennox. It's over. His name is going to be Hussein Rockman. I'm the champ, and nobody can take that away from me. I'm already a part of history. High atop the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York is a sleepy little town called Kerhonkson. It's an unlikely place to prepare to defend a title, but that's precisely where, for the next two weeks, Hasim Rahman, the new heavyweight champion of the world, has set up camp. Training camp goes back to the earliest days of the warriors and samurais, the gladiators. This is combat. This is battle. And this is the best place to prepare for battle. He needs to be to himself where the media can't get to him too much, where the public can't get to him too much, fans can't get to him too much. But right now, he really needs to isolate on just training. Okay, hey! The first week is really just the beginning stage. It's the time in which you are supposed to get your body in condition, you get the kinks out, you work on your beginning techniques. It's like anything, you know, you crawl before you walk. This ain't nothing new, me starting off sluggish, you know, but uh, I eventually work it out, work it out, work it out. Good stand, Pop I see some very dull edges where he needs to really sharpen up and get his quickness together. Even his stamina even needs to be better. So with my arms get this little bit of soreness out of it. I should be able to, you know, throw my punches, let my hands go, throw more combination. Be able to fight harder. Another day at the office. You want to switch jobs tomorrow? I hold the camera. You box a few rounds. <laughs> On the first day of camp, a pattern is established. A morning of serious sparring gives way to friendly, if competitive, fun. We play spades and talk. That's a way that we can really let go of the tension, break the monotony, and just relax. Everybody's away from home. Uh, we just, you know, just try to just pass the day. We enjoy it. Get back! Welcome to the House of Pain. What happened to the me? Oh. Oh. I thought that the, the CD somehow heard me sing and just shut down. <laughs> And I'm in there with two different guys. I ain't in there with one guy the whole time. So when the fresh guy coming in, you know, he's fresh. And he bringing what he's supposed to bring. Every single day that you're working to get into your championship fight, when you work with sparring partners, it's a chance of injury. Our sparring partner accidentally headbutted him. That became a panic for a second on everybody's part in the corner. You know, there's a lot of money at stake. The last thing I want to do is let a little cut stop me from making millions of dollars. But uh, you can't be in there scared like, oh, I might get cut. Oh, I might get hurt. If you think like that, you want to prepare for the fight. How can you prepare? I mean, I could sit home 
and eat Krispy Kreme, watch Nick at Night for two months, and go in there and get a bigger pay than, than most people ever dreamed about. But that's not me. I'm going in to win this fight and knock this man out. I'm looking for improvement. He's not like Lennox Lewis, who's 36, 37 years old, something like that. He's 28 years old, you know, so he can only go up right now. It's a work in progress, you know. And I feel like next week and the week after that and the week after that, I should be even better and better and better. Nice. Still, heavyweight champion of the world. Satisfied with his progress in the first week of training, Asim Rahman heads into New York City for a night on the town. We got a chance to get to the city, you know, visit New York. It was definitely a way to break the monotony a little bit. If you will, let your hair down. I really try to be as accessible and try to accommodate as many people as I can. I really want them to know that I'm a people's champion. I'm just like them, and I sit with them and talk with them and eat with them. And I try not to be surrounded by the bodyguards, you know. I want them to know, I, this is, I'm a normal guy just like you. There's one word that I sum it up, it's responsibility. So you do the extra autographs, you pose for the extra picture. Because, you know, I, I look at it like if it was me, you know, and I wanted that picture with the heavyweight champion of the world. Well, how would I feel if he told me no? Right. How about, how about, how about, how about Hashim, The Rock, Rock Bond, heavyweight champion of the world. Last stop is Madison Square Garden, the site of the Hopkins Trinidad Championship bout, where Hashim Rahman takes his place among other boxing stars of past and present. It was, it was Bernard and Felix's night. Uh, ultimately, it was Bernard's night, but my time is coming. My night will be there November 17th. But the dominant memory Hasim Rahman takes away from his night in New York are of the eerily quiet streets of a city permanently scarred by the unspeakable atrocities of the month before. New York was a little different than, than what I remember. It wasn't as hectic as I always remembered New York to be. It was just real slow down, real calm. And I, I had to attribute that to uh, September 11th. My sympathy and my heart goes out for them. First, he wakes up. That's a good start. The guys who are Muslim pray. His brother is uh, our cook. A couple of our sparring partners, the trainers, happen to be Muslims. If the weather is good outside, and if it's not too early, they'll get up and run. He won't stop if that you stop him. He just, you know, it goes on and on. You want to run four miles, it's enough for him to run six or seven. Then about uh, approximately uh, 12, 12.30, we start preparing to do our boxing. Yeah. He has to breathe, sleep, eat, work, preparing to defend his world title. We work full time around right? He's heavy handed. He's uh I mean well, the guy weighs like two forty five, two fifty right now. And uh he's a big man. In terms of percentages where I am and where I'm gonna be, I feel like I'm about twenty five percent. Turn the music up, up, up. The more you practice, the sharper you become. When you preparing for a fight of this magnitude, you should be getting better every day, every week. You know, every every week you should be doing something better. The reason we go and, and I study the tapes after a sparring session is because it's fresh in my mind. I'm just getting out of the ring. And I feel like I can remember exactly what happened. You're still working on a lot of kids. There you go. I have my hands out, position my hands in. Good. Good. 
Harage here with this one. Hey, just sharpening my shot and, and looking at shots. What I can do to prevent from getting hit with shot. Yeah, there you are. Right here, right here, right here. Look. Right there. See how you was right? Your left hand came right back at the right hand. Run back one more time. Look. Every minute, every minute. I can remember what I was thinking about when I did certain things. When I see myself, I say, oh, I know why I was doing that. And it's easier for me to correct it if I can really place my finger on it. After film review of the day's sparring, lunch is prepared by the camp cook, Shamsid Dean, who keeps a strict Muslim kitchen. We do not eat pork. Uh, we do not uh, eat animals who may have been killed by uh, a strong blow. Uh, and if we're eating uh, what is called zabiha, meaning that the meat has been slaughtered uh, by a Muslim in the name of God, you know, that is uh, strict Islamic uh, meat. No pork, nothing like that. Uh, but I can eat meat, fish, chicken, and uh, that's pretty much what I eat, greens and salad. Oh, boy, time to eat. How do you feel about cooking food for the champ? I feel great. <laughs> Don't do that, man. <laughs> Don't do that. Why you still... <laughs> <laughs> they sit you and you on a mission, huh? <laughs> What's the matter? Go get some napkin. So, no, no. I'll get that on my chest. So. Pretty good. Pretty good. Like it's straight out of Chesapeake's bed. Still filming, huh? Come on! Don't look stupid! Come on! Bam! 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 And still! I know you thought you were playing with, Sean! As training time in the Catskills comes to a close, a fired up Hassim Rahman spars at night to get in his last licks. Well, I feel like I'm um, much better shape. When I fought Lennox Lewis the first time, I'm ahead of the game. I'm definitely ahead of the game. I'm just feeling out process still. I'm just still working out a lot of kink. But a lot of good shots I'm cutting proper. I just need to do over and over and over. Good. Oh, beautiful. Woo! I told you. Well, everything I'm doing is designed for me to compete on November 17th. Uh, fights are won and lost in the gym. And in preparation. I'm going to prepare. Like I'm fighting for my life. I'm gonna see my mom, see my wife and my kids. You know, I see my sisters and brothers. So I'm gonna see everybody before I leave. Hey, what's up? What's up? For these kids, just looking in, looking at them, and you know, it makes them feel that hey. I send them right from the hood. It gives the kids inspiration that they can become champions in boxing and champions in life. I'm standing here in the downtown locker room with Baltimore's own Rock. He's won the heavyweight championship, but he really hasn't changed very much with the victory. He understands his role in history, the role of being heavyweight champion, and he wants to be a role model. What's up, Jack? Going on. The thing is, too many people get caught up in this whole heavyweight championship thing. You know, they, they tend to think that it makes you better than somebody. And I don't I don't take that route at all. I feel like I'm just as normal as anybody else. That's my city. And I feel like I'm their champion. And that's where I got my start. And I have a sense of responsibility. And I feel like I owe them something. It's my old block I grew up at. It was, you know, fun. We were all young. Coming up, we stuck together. It was a rough neighborhood because the peer pressure got to us. We had to be rough. So we had to force ourselves to be rough early. When he was 14 years old, he actually took down three grown men by himself. This guy was an, uh, an enforcer, you know. He was as tough as they came. Unfortunately, most of us didn't make it. 
Most of us even strung out on drugs to this day, in jail to this day, or gone. You know, I'm, I'm always have a place in my heart for it because this is where I came up at. So, uh, you know, it's home to me always. The neighborhood is nothing like it used to be. This was where it was at. This whole strip was just popping. I mean, this was the most money in the town, bringing 100 grand, 200 grand a day. This was the drugstore. Right here, where I'm standing, you know what I'm saying, just people were really, you know what I'm saying, getting killed right here in front of me. I was walking across the street right here, and some guys was running towards me, getting killed right in my face. Some of our best friends got killed right on these streets. He got shot five times in the belly. People don't get up and walk away from, from something like that. But Rock did. From every one success story, I, got, I, could, I could tell you 50 people who just didn't make it. What made Rock number one instead of one of 50 was a challenge he accepted from a local boxer to a body punching contest while standing on the corner of West Fayette and Gilmore on the mean streets of West Baltimore. Yeah, it was a former boxer, uh, Lewis Butler. Locally, everybody knew Lou Butler was a former fighter. I said to Hot Sims, I said, um, come on, uh, man, you from the test down to the waist. So he took me on and we went on the back of the parking lot. Just the thought of going one-on-one -on -one with a professional boxer, it's like, I don't belong in here with this man. But there was so many people around that I couldn't back down from the challenge. So I said, well, you know, let's got to go for it, you know? I'm digging the right hand up in him, and he just taped it and digging me back. I'm hitting with the left hook. He hitting me back. It was like buildings were shaking or something, you know what I'm saying? And two big guys just hitting each other, going to the body. And Rock is holding his own and, in fact, enjoying it. So, so Lou called Mac Lewis and said, you know, hey, Mac, you know, I, I saw this tough kid on the street. I think I got you a heavyweight. Lou Butler came to me and said, this young man can be something in boxing. And now if he don't get into boxing, he'd probably get in some trouble. I said, okay. He said, you can help him, Mr. Mac. I said, all right, bring him in and I'll try to help him. Yeah, so Mr. Mac, this is where it all started for me. This concern is just getting the kids out of the street, just trying to see, trying to change kids' life around. And he's been there for me since day one. He'd get in the ring and he'd loosen up. And then after he loosened up about maybe four or five rounds, then we would go through the heavy bag. Sometimes I'd go down and hold a bag for him so it wouldn't move too much. And this man was about 80-something years old. And I didn't want to hit the bag really hard because I felt like, man, I'm going to get this man a heart attack. So I just started hitting the bag just lightly. And he'd tell me, look, hit the bag, boy, hit the bag. You know, Mr. Mack get to hollering at me, hit the bag. So I had to hit the bag hard. He said, that's the hardest you can hit the bag. And he'd make me hit it harder and harder and harder. <laughs> He was a powerful young man, very powerful. And I could see that he was going to be a great fighter. Whenever somebody go ask him about any other heavyweight, he'd tell him, the sleeper is me. You know, he'd say, that, that the boy is right there. And I got him an amateur fight, and he won that, and he looked good. <laughs> most important thing in anything in life, you got to want to be it. And he wanted to be a fighter. And he was, he was just anxious to be somebody. I'm here with Rocky, Rasim, Rasim Mahan. Mahan, Rocky. Ready? Cue I'm here with Rasim. I'm here with Rasim. Rockman. Thank you, thank you. We're getting a little better. We're getting a little better. We're getting a little better. Hey, thanks for yeah. asking. How are you, man? How are you? How are you? How are you? 20 How are you? years old. But when Hassem Rockman turned pro in 1994, he and Mr. Mack would reluctantly part company. Baltimore really didn't have the heavyweights to really take me to the next level to facilitate what I was trying to accomplish. But uh, Mr. Mack, he got everything started for me, and I owe him everything. When he turned pro, he really was a very inexperienced fighter. He had very, very few skills. He was just a big, strong, tough guy. Though Hassan began with a seemingly impressive string of victories, critics questioned his skills and the quality of his opposition. The Rock was virtually ignored, and he bristled at the lack of respect. Everybody told me I wasn't going to make it. I couldn't be this opponent. I couldn't be that opponent. But he had those heavy hands. He had the ability to throw a punch 
whether he threw it correctly or incorrectly, but when it landed, no matter how it was thrown, it did damage. There we go. That's it. I watched some of the earlier tapes of him. He was hurting guys in, you know, knocking guys out. Some of the people he fought had the experience of fighting other contenders, ranked fighters. They all went away feeling the same way. They never got hit harder in a fight than they did by Hasim the Rock Rockman. I just developed this attitude, like I can't be beat, I fight anybody, I, I know I'm gonna be the champion. A real cocky, arrogant type of attitude. Hasim had every reason to have an arrogant attitude. In his four-year professional career, he had proved the doubters wrong by running up an unblemished record of 29-0 and 0 with 24 knockouts. And in the early rounds of his 30th fight against another up-and-comer, David Tua, he was comfortably ahead. Not only was Rahman in the fight, he was winning the fight. Out jabbing him, out maneuvering. In the ninth round, Tua hits him clearly very late after the bell. Looked intentional. The bell rings, and then Tua throws the punch. Oh, oh. Rachman should be given at least five full minutes to recover from something like that. He wasn't given the five minutes. In the next round, he's still obviously dazed. Tua going to work. Rachman not throwing. Tua flashing to the body with right to left. Rachman in trouble. And the referee's going to stop it. Stop the fight. I, I believe that is a very bad stoppage. The Tua fight, I really feel to this day that I still beat him. I was 29 and no going in the fight, and I said I was 29 wins with one robbery after I left the fight. But his bout against Oleg Muskayev was no robbery. It was an embarrassing disaster. He took that fight very lightly. He just thought this guy got knocked out by Oliver McCall in the first round. It, this isn't going to be a tough fight for me. He dropped his hands and he gets smacked and out of the ring, actually. <laughs> Crowd. His followers were so irate, they were whooping on anybody they could find. It was a riot. The winner by a knockout, Oleg Maskaev! It really just humbled me because Maskaev was a guy who definitely I, I should have beaten easy. It was a wake-up call for me to really take inventory of myself, like, what's going on here? That defeat sent Rock stock tumbling as the wise guys in the world of boxing consigned him to the category of also rams and could have been. It was a crucible for Hasim Rockman because he was so angered at himself for losing to a Moscow, okay, that he dedicated himself to the Corey Sanders fight. Going in, I told all the TV announcers that uh, if I can't beat Corey Sanders, it would show me I can't be heavyweight champion in the world. And I would leave the sport of box. It was a great heavyweight action fight. He was hurt seriously several times in that fight. Oh, that and what it came down to was Hart, who wanted it more. Now Sanders tries to finish up with 30 seconds to go on the round. He himself on a counter right hand. And it was very impressive. Rockman wanted it more. Sanders covering up. I felt like the only thing that was left for me to do was win the heavyweight championship of the world. I had been to the low, so I had to get you the high point. And on April 22, 2001, in Brock Pond, South Africa, he'd do just that. Some six years and 36 fights after leaving Mr. Max's gym, Hasim the Rock Rockman got his shot at the title. Well, let's see if Rockman will try to out jab the jabber as he told us he thought he could. When I hit him, he spun me around. I was already cocked to throw the punch again, but uh, he was out of my range. A couple seconds later, Rockman jab, 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 jab. Lewis goes across the ring, drops his hand, doesn't get his left hand back up. But I saw his chin. His chin seemed like it was just this big. I couldn't miss the shot. You know, a right hand that you can land. 
it's hard to get up from that punch, no matter who you are. I kept my composure, walked over to the ring, and, you know, 10 seconds later, the new heavyweight champion in the world. A lot of people keep saying, oh, look at that one lucky punch. It was one of the greatest planned executions in the history of boxing. I'm the champ, and nobody can take that away from me. You know, when you mention guys like Joe Lewis, Muhammad Ali, Rocky Marciano, I'm along that lineage. I'm already a part of history. Big Bear is the most ideal place to train for a fight. You have the altitude. You have 7,000 feet above sea level. You have incredibly beautiful, clean, fresh air. You have no outside distractions. A fighter can focus on his task at hand. The hard stuff starts in Big Bear, you know. No more going to the city. No more going to see the kids. No more seeing, that's it until fight night. The show is on. It's time to work. It's time to go. It's time to go. When it's on, it's on. Right here. What time? Hassan Rahman will retain the championship on November the 17th. Oh, AD leading his charge to the promised land. <laughs> It just so happens that he's the heavyweight champion of the world, and, you know, he can afford to bring me up here to Big Bear with him. And also, I got an appreciation for what he was doing, because when he was doing it at first and I didn't do it, it looked pretty easy. He made it look real easy. But <laughs> when I started to do it, it was difficult. <laughs> to me, it, it, it's like the ultimate respect that I could pay to my dad if I have a son. And if my son would invite me to, to go through camp with him for his first defense for the heavyweight championship of the world, I mean, that would make me just proud as a dad. <laughs> it's the touchy-feely kind of thing that I appreciate, and I'm sure he appreciates it as well. I'm here for my son, Hasim, and we happen to share the same religion. And because there happens to be other Muslims in the camp, then I carry the role of imam. There's certain rights that he has, and certain rights he's not allowed to infringe upon. Likewise with God. The imam is the leader of the congregation, and he's responsible for guiding his congregation to proper worship uh, and adhering to the dictates that are defined for us in our, in our faith. He makes sure that everything's on point and we all keep our prayers in order and then he teaches me and uh, it's, it's just beneficial all the way. Because my son happens to be the heavyweight champion of the world, no one should feel that he should separate himself from what his normal religious duties would be. We do not separate our religious beliefs with our normal day-to-day -day life. We believe it's interwoven. <laughs> Champ! Oh, he's here! The champ is here! How about how you did, Rock? What's your prediction for this fight? I think I'll knock Lennox Lewis out. I have a set schedule, so anytime something interrupts for more than five or ten minutes, you know, uh, it just disrupts my whole schedule. But it's, it's part of responsibility as a champ that I had to make myself accessible. Every time his face is shown, every time he's on radio, Anytime he is interviewed by a major media outlet, he becomes that much better known. You know, that's a religion, as you know, of, uh, of peace, right? And, the, uh, and yet some of these people in the name of that religion are attacking, you know, American. I think there's a clear difference, and I think everybody knows there's a clear difference between Islam and terrorism. If it was any other religion, you know, I asked myself, would, would people be asking the question? But, uh, you know, I heard the president say that, you know, and I feel like, you know, America knows there's a difference, and I'm, and I'm confident in that. It's not a religious war. 
these are fanatics. And to ask anyone who was born in this country uh, what he feels about uh, uh, them and it and Muslims and whatever, I think is ridiculous. It really doesn't bother me because I understand that controversy sells, and that's their job, you know. I don't take it personal, and I'm cool in the game. Come on over here. You take a shower. I just wanted to get my rounds in. I ain't really want them to know what I'm working on. And I feel like, you know, I'm the new guy on the scene. Lennox has been around for years and years and years. He may have a relationship with one or two of those reporters. And I'm not so sure that one of those tapes that the tape yesterday wouldn't slide into his hand. So definitely I wasn't trying to, you know, really, really go all out. So we play dominoes. The pleasure comes in just being able to tease whoever lose for a while. Clean my dishes, dude. <laughs> Get my dishes help, done. Help. Give me ten. Oh. Okay. I punished him the first game. He begged me for this rematch. <laughs> Champions work is never done. We get in. Come on, man. Tell Wiggy he got fined for missing the gym. <laughs> we'll bring him. Yeah, tell him he fined anyway. He missed the rematch. See ya. <laughs> I was looking for you. <laughs> what time? That's how you work. Devaro Williamson is a very good technical fighter. He's always pushing himself to push rock and because of that it adds fire into the work that they do together thank you the champs sharp shots gave way to sharp words during the post fight tape review session it got hot because the viral was upset at winky what you said about me? I was saying that uh -uh. if you could take five minutes of doing while we train yeah. Yeah, to, to work with me and tell me the, the correct thing to get the rock, because if I can I'm not going to tell you nothing to get it. You got to figure it out just like he got to figure it out. I'm not going to tell you nothing to get to him. Why not? That's him. I mean, why, why the hell would I do some stupid something like that? Winky was supposed to be working with the viral, and the viral felt that Winky was sort of doing a twofold job, preparing him to go out and get slaughtered and rooting for rock. You can't wait to get your little fat buddy. Wow. I'm going to slam you, Joe. I was beating your body for two rounds. I'm going to get in your face. I ain't put no gloves on. I'm going to slam you. I'm going to break your neck. Me against the world, baby. Me against the world. I know what Tupac was going through. Stop crying. He crying. Yeah, he crying. Sure, I do do that every time I'm with him. Oh, my God. Hey. You're crap. Hey. After knocking yet another sparring partner out of action, Asim's younger brother, Ibn, bravely steps into the ring. He handled him like a lion would handle a cub. And so what I saw was a very, very wholesome uh, relationship between two brothers, and I was very happy about it. He got out of there for the fifth round. He been watching the tape of Lennox Lewis. He, he didn't want the fifth round, actually. He can have all the rest of the round. I just want the fifth. Jail.